Hello everybody, welcome in Belgium. I introduce to you Yves, my son-in-law. Today, we are very lucky to receive Dr. Darpe and uh, Dr. Lecoq for the presentation. Please don't forget to write your question. The answer will give you after the presentation. We will directly give the word to Dr. Darpe. Hello, welcome to this uh, ACR and uh, Kevin Bacon uh, sponsored uh, streaming. I think I would like to thank Jean-Jacques, Yves uh, and uh, Antoine for inviting me to this streaming. I was in Belgium to work with Yves on uh, pathological horses and uh, other horses in uh, loss of performance uh, in uh, preventing lameness service or even improving performance service. Uh, this is the first time I do a streaming uh, online uh, and um, this conference is uh, totally sponsored by ACR and uh, Kevin Bacon. So it's a kind of new for me. I mean, I have been speaking in uh, so many congresses that are halfway sponsored, commercial and scientific. Uh, the, the only percent scientific symposium I've been it was in Berlin in 2010, uh, the International Laminitis Symposium, um, organized by Professor Bodo Herch. And, uh, but in all the other hundreds of Congress I've been, it was a uh, halfway. This is a, a poor blood <laughs> sponsored uh, streaming. So, it's a new experience for me. I would uh, I would like to uh, to not talk too much and bore you about all the congresses and speeches I have done. You can check that on uh, my website, and you can see all of them. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, just. For those who doesn't know me, I will let me introduce myself briefly. I am Dr. Lorenzo Darpe. I am a veterinarian, equine podiatrist. I've always been dealing with laminitis for the last 20 years. I have been, uh, has been, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Rick Redden in uh, Kentucky. I've been uh, years for with him, uh, assisting him and taking his Flem to to be his uh, European uh, assistant. Then I have done my PhD at the University of Padua, the Galileo University. My PhD has been uh, on uh, on the venogram, so I, I just do this, nothing else. And uh, since uh, 2000, uh, I, I discussed my PhD in 2009, and uh, now since uh, 2017. I have been a professor on uh, laminitis in the University of Bologna. Bologna is the oldest university of the West world. And I teach uh, laminitis and other food pathologies, nothing else. So I, I, I don't want to bore you more. So let's talk uh, in more detail uh, about uh, what can make ACR shoes and uh, Kevin Bacon products with my services to help you best in order to improve the well-being of your horse. Let's see, we are talking about high quality products, but anyway, let's see who are the target. Because uh, in Maslow Pyramid that has been done for men, we can translate this for horses and uh, of course, Horses, wild horses, they first need to satisfy their primary needs. So hay, water, then find a straw bedding, uh, a box to repair themselves. And of course, somebody to 
care for them if they are blessed or whatever. But anyway, these horses doesn't have the money to pay the services we give and uh, to pay the products of uh, these uh, enterprises. So we only care about uh, secondary need horses. So horses that are domestic horses, uh, that they have a social group, a owner who care of them, they have uh, a grooming to keep their, them clean and so on. And that's why they can care of uh, secondary things as a competition. And some of them can really satisfy himself in uh, the personal satisfaction, whatever is their activity. Anyway, why am I talking about all this? Because I know that in uh, America there is a little bit of confusion about wild horses because in America uh, you have wild uh, dom domestic horses that are free in Nevada, in Oklahoma and so on, but they don't have competitors. So they spread all the country, reproducing themselves as uh, rats, <laughs> more likely. But anyway, I like more the Australian study about wild horses where they have a really tough life. They are really competitors as alligator, crocodiles. They have tough desert, tough rains and whatever. So they selected these uh, six regions that uh, shape, depending on the environment, the, uh, the, the fit. But anyway, as you can see from this group study, their life is really tough. So the incidence of laminitis on this horse is really high. So wildlife is not so ideal as somebody think today. And furthermore, the life length of this horse is really short. The mean average of the life of these horses is four or five years. <laughs> So domestic horses, of course, they have to resist the psychology of their owner that care of them, but it's not unusual to see domestic horses that have an average, a mean, a mean life of 15, 20, it's not rare to see horses at 30, 30 years, 35 years today. So what do we do? We care of uh, whatever locomotion activity, sport attitude, athletic uh, horse in order to prevent lameness and uh, even improve the vascular uh, problem in order to improve the performance. Of course there are many kind of loss of, loss of performance. I only care about uh, vascular problem of the feet in order to prevent lameness for the foot or improve the performance of the vascular foot. Furthermore, I care a lot of uh, the quasi-static movement. So I care a lot of uh, not only the competition shoeing or trimming, but a lot of the box rest, because if you can improve the box rest condition, you will have a better athlete that can have rested comfortably, so he can perform better. What do I look for? I look for corium. What is the corium? The corium is the vascular supply of the skin that produce uh, can look, look how it is, it, it is rich. This, uh, the corn, what is? Is the skin that produces the horn of the foot and the horn of the hair. So that's because of the horn of the foot and the hair, you cannot see the skin. So you cannot see what can be seen on humans for the vascular problems that you can see even with the naked eye. On the horse, you cannot see at the naked eye. So, you can see the corium in ex vivo on dead horses, dead feet. You open and you can see the corium, but still, what you lose? 
you, you lose the blood flow. That is the most interesting thing. Why it's so important for Ferrier to look at the corium, to have an idea of where is the corium? To avoid a red nail. Of course, we, lock, we love blood, but not outside of the hoof capsule. <laughs> we like inside the hoof capsule. <laughs> anyway, we can see on dead feet uh, the vascular supply to the foot. Somebody even used my five earth theory I formulated at the University of Lyon, the oldest veterinary university in the world, in France, founded by a furrier. <laughs> so you can imagine this, but you cannot see while you are showing, while you are nailing. So why, when you cannot see really what you, what, you, what you are dealing with, you can imagine many things. But if you imagine that the, flu, the, the, the hurt is flat and you can only find the drawings about that, you could have some surprise. <laughs> so the only way to see that in that moment what is happening is to have a picture, to see, to have an image. So this is the first picture from the Apollo that showed from real that the Earth was a kind of spheric. So, following this attitude in my research science approach, I love a venogram. Why? Because you can see the corium on a live horse in vivo. And even if you change the palmar angle from negative 15 to positive 15, you can see sudden changes in the vascular bed. And even if you do a, uh, if you change the angle transversally, lateral medially, you can see sudden changes here. And this is after one minute. Imagine this after one week or after three weeks or after four months. It cannot be red. It, it will be blue and then gray and then black. <laughs> Why am I saying that? Because you need to see the color, but you cannot see on the horse because the hoof capsule is uh, so thick and pigmented, you cannot see through. So you need to, to cut on a dead horse, but you see, you lose the, uh, the blood flow. You can reproduce that even with scan, uh, uh, in dead horses, but you can see on a live horse in, uh, on x-rays, but you don't see the corium. So you can see on scintigraphy the inflammation of soft tissues, but it's not so specific. You can see a lot of things with uh, MRI, but you can see mostly bone uh, uh, inflammation. Then with arterography, there are many publications, but the arterography shows much more the navicular region, the podotrochlear region. So to see the corium outside the P3 and inside the hoof capsule, you need a vein. That's all. You can see many things. You can see the suspensory apparatus showed by Paulette recently. So this is the gold standard to see corium in vivo in the imaging diagnosis. And this lets you see what happens to the corium standing, to the corium unloaded, uh, mimicking what, uh, what happens walking. You can see what happens leaning. You can see many things in uh, how the horse live in his environment, in his domestic environment, of course. No wild horse can pay a venogram. It can be offered for research. Uh, I, uh, I, Redden and I, we did some venogram on Mustangs uh, in the interfaces. But anyway, you can see the corium on dead legs and you can see the corium on humans, finger and nail, but normally it's pink. When it's inflammated, it can be red. 
can be blue with hematoma. Hematoma is really painful and you can see here, but you cannot see here. And it can be gray when chronic choreomyitis comes and you have the separation of the dermal epidermal lamellar gear. You can see here, but finally when the choreomosis, so the degeneration, not the inflammation, not acute or chronic inflammation, you have the degeneration, the hypoxia, anoxia, degeneration of the tissue that turns to black. And when this is accomplished, completed, there is nothing more to do. This is necrosis. So, uh, sorry to surprise you, I'm not a clinician. Be why? Because my father was a clinician. Uh, uh, we always followed clinically the symptoms, pain. But today, we have so many images that uh, clinic uh, is good, but imaging is much better. <laughs> so, what we have in uh, the acute and chronic inflammation of the corium, we have hyperglycemia, we have digital pulse, that is uh, much easier to, not, uh, it's re rare to see it, it's more usual to palpate with the fingers. You can have inflammation that can be detected by thermography. Thermography detects the inflammation, doesn't detect blood flow. That's a research work I have done in the University of Padua. So what is more at the center of everybody's attention? The pain. But pain is present when there is inflammation, when there is edema, when there is a low pH for acid environment of the cell, of the, around the nociceptor. So pain is always present when there is inflammation. But when there is choreomosis, there is no glycemia, there is no inflammation, there is not pain, there is only pulse because there is a stop to blood flow. So you have a, an increased arterial pulse. So this is what scares me. And when the choreomosis is accomplished, you will have pain, but there is nothing more to do. You cannot treat choreomosis when it's accomplished. That's what choreomosis is what you call the contralateral load laminitis. That's the development of a venocompression that doesn't lead oxygen to the hemidesmosomes and desmosome, so the cytoskeleton will collapse. That's choreomosis because of anoxia. So, where comes the pain from? Everybody looks for, for bones, so I have done this densitometry study on 30 horses before, um, before euthanasia, and uh, the horses that did have more than 18 millimeters the periosteum was normal, no pain, no lame. The horses that uh, did have less than 18 millimeters of sole, they did have uh, if a osteoclast making an osteolysis of the bone and you see liquid fr coming from the osteolysis. Where the pains come from? From the liquid of the osteolysis. That looks like serum. This makes a pouch, compress the corium. The corium is uh, so rich of nociceptor and perceptor, much richer than an avicular bone. So many times everybody looks for an avicular bone, but the corium is much more sensible to pain than the navicular. So some, sometimes even if you have a real navicular, and you look for corium, you can compensate the pain of the navicular and make your horse happy and jump or run. So this is what scares me. Let's look at this. It's not 
the bone remodeling of the soul or the rotation that are painful. That's the edema that is painful. So if you want to see if the edema, it's not useless, it's useless to use an arteriography. Why? Because you, you see the inside part of uh, the vascular bed of the foot, the inside to the ungual cartilage. With the venogram, you see the outside part of the ungual cartilage, so the corium, so the sock, the, the, the dermal sock that is between the bone and the hoof capsule. So this is the part that can be compressed. And here you can see clearly the arterial plexus of the sole and the venous plexus of the coronary band and the bulbar vessels. So these are like swimming pools with a lot of water. With a lot of water. Why am I talking about war? Because in architecture, what we know, this is the Tower of Pisa is well known all around the world. So if there is a lack of water here, what happens? That the tower will sink. And after sinking, it will be unstable. So it, will, it can go left or right. And it can fall. <laughs> so we can handle that for Stuart to keep it a little bit leaning, but not to fall, because it would be a disaster for the tourist in Pisa. Same thing for the foot. You have a bony column, you have an arterial plexus. If you have an inflammation, what happens? That this the, the P3 will sink and will have a vertical dislocation. This will make uh, the bony column unstable and can uh, lead the bony column to compress laterally the coronary pl venous plexus or medially, that is much more frequent, the coronary venous plexus. So, same, not only in the lateral medial, but also in the dorsal palmar, what we can see that P3, even with uh, an inflammation, there is always uh, the activation of metalloperatinases, so the dermapidermal gear can be separated, so P3 can go down and compress the arterial plexus and can have a vertical dislocation. When you have a chronic, you already have the dermoepidermal lamellar separation, so you will have rotation, and you have compression of the coronary venous plexus. Same thing on the other hand. So it can go with a negative palmar angle that will be painful when? Only when you have, have an atrophy of the cushion and uh, the corum will touch the ground. That will what can make the horse sensible. Not all negatives are painful, but when they come here, they are all painful. So, and what you can have, what somebody calls a reverse rotation. Anyway, let's look at my table. In my table, what you have? You have the vascular problems due to unbalance as the Tower of Pisa. So, in a acute inflammation, you, you have the vertical dislocation. What I, do I use uh, of, uh, uh, of these products? I use the U formula, that's a biotin with sulfur that accelerates the hoof growth. What do I use? I use uh, the 5 Hz boot that I patented in uh, 2007. And I use this because they are rubber made and you can do cryotherapy for, uh, freezing the soul. And you have the auto messaging effect in order to pump blood. Because if you don't pump blood, you can freeze the soul, but still P3 will sink. And prolonged cryotherapy. The, uh, prolonged cryotherapy, it means at least 72 hours. It's no sense in laminitis to do one hour of cryotherapy. You, 
you could even worse the condition in my experience so that, let's make an example because I'm not only a professor I have been 20 years of I have 20 years of skilled and experience so this is an acute what happens this can lead you to an ingrown hoof that can cut the skin it's so painful like like for us an ingrown nail for a human it's really painful same for the horse it's not the bone that is painful is the skin so one month later if you cannot put all this in a virtuous circle you are in a vicious circle so the situation the condition is worsening and this can be a big problem this laminitis as you know is the second death, death cause what happens uh, on the other hand with uh, a choreomosis it can happen the same thing there is the sinking but everything is much slower it's not like in an acute where you have you are dealing with uh, some hours some days at least some weeks of uh, uh, of negative process that can lead the, your horse to the death here you are dealing with uh, some weeks maybe some month problem uh, it's not so so fast so you can deal also of course I use always a, I, I like the hoof formula to speed up the hoof growth I like the hoof solution in order to dry and harden the soil in order to protect the corium much better and I like uh, auto messaging three-dimensional chewing okay this put an out message that will active the pump of the foot that are the muscles of the shoulder of the antibrachium of the of the leg that will pump blood inside the foot okay that's my five brain theory on uh, 2014 you can check that on my website anyway that's what the core room look like and that's what the corium look like when the point of no return the tipping point of no return has been already reached so my goal is to prevent this and go back to this in a vicious in a virtuous circle i don't like the vicious circle so this is an example of a, a big problem with the chronic also with the lateral median imbalance veins were so fragile black blood was coming out of my tube of the butterfly and the horse was uh, really uh, was really difficult to, to stand up huh? for him so for this horse without messaging showing and all the therapies of poetry therapy we activated it has taken nine months just to go back to gallop and uh, one year and a half to go back to jump but anyway here the blood coming out from my tube was uh, much more red and uh, fluid not viscous so this is another situation we have reached the virtuous circle everybody is much happier it's not such a frustrating disease if you know how to deal with it when we are dealing with the lateral compression or a medial compression what I use I use the oof formula of course the oof solution the troisant soixante and I use the oof dressing this no this why because I need to soften the horn in order to let the coronary plexus breathe and uh, if I can you if I can treat conservatively if I arrive too late I will be obliged to do an avulsion to be ag surgically aggressive but if I can I like much more to be conservative because all good surgeon like to be conservative as much as possible same thing on the medial so this is an example this is a broodmare world champion 
she's ready to fall a really nice horse but there is the lockdown so I cannot go there and uh, she is uh, growing and growing she's a Nubia's horse as many <laughs> and uh, so when I arrive there she is in pain and she is ready to start to accomplish a chorimosis so we we trim we shoe differently one month later still we are dealing with uh, the lateral medial balance and the upgoing uh, wall we are improving here we are out of pain she fold so she was much lighter this has helped us a lot uh, as well here we are in september in october of, four, of course she she unshod but there is a complete new foot she went under mri and they found uh, a, a little zone of uh, osteolysis so everybody was worried for her performance career after I did a vein my veinogram and everything was going much better but most of all this zone my veinogram tells me that the quorum is going to restore completely so everybody's happy that she can go back to the world champions anyway so this is just to tell you that this is a, a, an imaging that is a specialized for the core and tells you much more than every other diagnostic imaging on the core. What, 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 so we, we found a, a vicious circle, a, a virtuous circle. What am I talking about? This is the muscle as tennis elbows you can have a spastic contraction that is called the distractor syndrome. So in the equi meeting last year, I showed for the first time that you can prove the distractor syndrome also on a horse with a vicious circle when you have a stasis of a blood, venous blood or lymph, lympha inside the foot, you will have a contraction of the muscle. The contraction of the muscle will increase the stasis and so on so this is a vicious circle that can be shown immediately with sudden changes of the corium of the coronary band with the venogram with my uh, darpe moro port block with flexion extension so where lies the pain where come where the pains come from look at this source the pain seems to come from the foot so I propose a tenotomy they tell me that the, it could be dangerous to cut the tendon of this uh, mare because uh, her value is, uh, is uh, really high so uh, my head could be cut if I cut the tendon so fortunately I did have a taker so I massaged the muscle for five minutes following my theor following my theory on the muscular foot pump and this is after five minutes so after four months of taker three-dimensional chewing prolonged continuous cryotherapy and so on we go back with the vi virtuous circle to full activity and she won second place in the world championship the day uh, the year after after escaping from a certain for, from a death okay what what do auto messaging three-dimensional showing do this is what it does it induce mild contractions of the muscles that pump blood inside the foot so that's all what is the key point <laughs> because uh, everybody could do play, could place a three-dimensional showing but not everybody knows how to have uh, a good x-ray podiatry x-ray as i have learned uh, at first with rick redden but then i developed my own technique on measuring uh, to protect the corium and uh, 
If you look for bones, you can be lost because you want just to avoid the red nail. But this way, you stay in the vicious circle. So if you look for the quorum and you visualize where is the quorum, that's how you, you can settle the lateral medial imbalance and get in a virtuous circle. So what is normal? Because to recognize pathology, you need to know what is normal. So normal is a foot not painful, not a lame foot, but a lame foot still has uh, some uh, variety of normality, some degrees of normality. So a close to normal foot, what is a normal foot? <laughs> a normal foot is a foot that is not, not painful and not, uh, that doesn't make a, a lame horse, okay? So everybody knows no foot, no horse, but that's a double negative phrase. So I like more to use a double positive phrase that uh, even if on a normal foot, if uh, you have a, a good uh, sole depth, you have a strong foot. If you have a, a not depth, not good sole depth, you have a weak foot. So on this foot, on a normal foot, papilla of the sole are not evident. On strong foot, papilla of the sole are long. So this horse will make a new foot in maybe six months. This, as on the school, uh, on the school books, is nine months. But this, it can make three years to make a new foot. So this foot is really weak. So it's really at high risk to show a lameness. Let's take a look at this. These are the so-called navicular syndrome that needs, in my opinion, in my experience, to be differentiated with solar traumatic choromitis, with negative palmar and plantar angles, and atrophic cushion. What am I talking about? There are no symptoms, only pain. No pulse, sometimes, yes, a little bit of pulse. There is no hyperglycemia. There is uh, not always a hot foot, sometimes, yes. But anyway, there is pain. Otherwise, they don't call you to visit these horses. Look at this. Corium, the solar, the solar arterial plexus is not visible. Look at this, the difference. So P3 is sinking and you have compression also of the coronary venous plexus. Look at the difference. So this is a weak foot and uh, this is compressed and you have a sear distance that is higher than 25, 20, 15, 14 millimeters. So you have uh, in this case 25 millimeters and you have bone remodeling of the sole. This is a loss of performance, okay? It can be confused with an avicular problem, but this is a arterial plexus vascular problem. And this can lead on hard ground or even to fractures of the primary processes. You, you, it's not like a school. In practice, you can have on a foot many pathologies at the same time. So for instance, this horse was lame for many years, after two years of therapy, they were not succeeding, so they called me. We put a protocol with uh, Dondolino in box rest for two months, and then an auto-messaging shoes for other two months, and the horse was back to activity after many years of inactivity. So, another example. This one is much high uh, gravity, higher risk because it can is ready to develop even a, a so-called laminitis. So this is a show jumper. So here he was doing very good. He was galloping. So they wanted uh, they asked me if he was ready to jump, but suspensory apparatus is still evident. So I will not the horse, the horse jump for even some more 
months. Why? If you have an X-ray, you can take the risk to make him jumping and maybe he will recidive. So you need to see the venogram to surf the wave and be sure of what you are doing. So let's take a look at pathology service. These are the so-called laminitis. In 20 years of experience, <laughs> on many hundreds of case, uh, acute laminitis cases that I have been referred to me, on 100 cases, only 5% of them are really a dermepidermal acute inflammation separation. <laughs> All the other 95, what are there? Maybe they are chronic that they are in a, a reacute phase, or maybe they are other foot pathologies as contracted or club foot or white line disease or what or uh, whatever i mean <laughs> that's pathologies of the foot whatever has a, a little idea edema it can make the foot painful it doesn't mean that it's uh, only laminitis can be painful on the foot <laughs> laminitis doesn't mean f foot pain <laughs> so you need to put a differential diagnosis on whatever you find. So let's take a look at the acute inflammation. You have the arterial plexus, sinking of P3, see a distance that is much more a prognostic, that has much more a prognostic value than rotation. This is the only Me uh, radiographical measurement that can make a pro prognosis. So, on this case, I, what I do, I use I use uh, the hoof formula to speed up the hoof growth. I use the five hertz booth that are rubber made, so they can keep the cold in uh, inside uh, inside the boot. And they have the auto messaging foot uh, effect to pump the blood. What happens? What happens? X-ray, you look at the corum, it's red. If everything is okay, you have no bone remodeling. But if you have a sinking, you will have bone remodeling, hematomas, the corum will be touching the ground, so it will be painful, and you will have bone remodeling of all the solar aspect of P3. So what happens? In the, in the normal, even in the X-ray, you can see that the corum is still uh, pink. You can see that the arterial plexus is okay. You can see that the normal is not remodeled. But on, in the sinking one, you have a thin sole, bone remodeling, hematomas, and the corum is touching the ground, so it's really painful. And you will have bone remodeling of the, all the solar aspect of P3 that you can see from here compared to normal. But this is not painful. What is painful? This, the edema is painful. And this is painful. This is the edema that is so painful. But here, I'm not uh, like this when the, end, the game is ended. Here we are at one week. So everything is uh, already necrosed. Everything is, the column is already black. Here, I am at 12 hours. So what I do, I do my venogram. I can see that there is a problem. Houston, there is a problem. So what I do? I use uh, cryotherapy and all, all these kind of things to take the horse out of pain, but I check if I am doing okay, if I am on the good wave or I am uh, in, the, in the wrong wave. So this is the horse one week after, out of pain, and at two months I will put a shoe. I will never put a shoe before two months from the first symptom because you can be the responsible of overloading the contralateral foot and induce the sinking. <laughs> you can be 
that responsible. You need to lift the horse up if you want to put whatever, or you need to, to take a few seconds to put a solution, not some hours. Otherwise, you have killed the foot. So you are in a vicious circle. <laughs> there are so many causes of, uh, of lamin so-called laminitis, but anyway, there are at least seven. But anyway, this is another one, the black walnut. It doesn't make an inflammation, it makes a toxic edema. So they, for the toxic edema, you do three holes, and you will solve the interstitial edema. And the horse will be out of pain with uh, just draining the interstitial edema. You don't need cryotherapy, okay? Anyway, in this case, you have an, the arterial plexus. Here we are already chronic. So we have the dermoepidermal separation of the lamellar gear that is already accomplished. And P3 moved, dislocated, so it will compress the coronary venous plexus and the bulbar vessels. But these are always out of danger. But anyway, you will have a sea distance that is much more important of rotation. Rotation is no value of prognosis, has zero value, value of prognosis. The rotation says that you have a chronic, nothing more. It's not even pantoneumonic of laminitis. <laughs> it can be on a club foot, it can be on a white line. It can, it's really easy to misunderstand white line and chronic or acute laminitis. Anyway, this has zero value. We have horses with 90 degrees of rotation that go back to jump. We have horses with zero rotation and a lot of sea distance that they die. So, what do I use? O formula, O solution, no cryotherapy because hyperglycemia is not always present, and uh, the shoes. What do I add? I use sometimes hoof dressing just to soften the hoof wall and let the coronary band plexus breathe. <laughs> if I can be conservative. Of course, if I am too late, I will be surgically aggressive, but I like much more to be conservative here in the old Europe. <laughs> so let's see a chronic. What, what happens with chronic? You are educated at Ferrier School to follow the landscape of the hoof capsule that shows you what happened to the corium four months ago. <laughs> So you are uh, betrayed. Why? Because you are confused by the distortion of the hoof capsule. Because you follow the white line and all these landscapes that makes you putting a flat shoe or a bidimensional shoe on the apex of the corium. But if you look for the corium, you will put the shoe underneath the corium and the horse will thank you and the corium will thank you and you go not to a vicious circle but to a virtuous circle so what happens that you can go out of pain because if you have an edema pouch here that is so painful this they can even fistulize by themselves but you need to be there in the 10 minutes before the liquid dry <laughs> to see or you can need to do a hole and to drain it to make the horse out of pain but anyway you need to unload and restore the corm if possible to make him back to pink so and if the seroma is contaminated by bact bacteria bacteria you can have an abscess of course this is so painful everybody knows that so to make you understanding that the clinic is not valuable in this kind of disease, I draw a flowchart inspired by Simon Curtis, my friend in Newmarket, drawing my own flowchart. So the normal foot, the acute phase in the first 72 hours, the horse will not move a lot. 
So it can develop a choreumosis, a venal compression. After six weeks, what happens? You can go back to normal or you have a chronic, lifelong. So in this phase, the chorium is pink. You need to improve the performance of the chorium just to stay normal. Because P3 is floating in the liquid. If you have no liquid, P3 will sink, whatever you, you do to the bone. So you need to work to stay normal because you are surfing on a liquid wave, always. You need to be on the wave. In the acute phase, you have a, a symptomatic compensated phase where you are in trouble, but the horse doesn't show you. You need to stay back to normal. You are red, corium, but you need to go back to pink. Here, you have symptoms. It's not compensated. The horse is painful. That's when you call. <laughs> okay? It's not like the scientific induction of laminitis when you inject the, the, the glucose. Here is when the client calls you by phone. Here, you have 72 hours, but here you need to unload the corium, decompress the corium immediately. Here you have major damage, and when the damage will be accomplished, you will have euthanasia. That's the main cause of uh, laminitis death, that is considered the second death cause. But anyway, what happens if you don't arrive here? That you will, you will, your corium will be blue, then violet, then gray, and then you will have a sudden death. This phase can be asymptomatic completely. I've seen horses trotting, galloping, even jumping in the next weeks. If here everything is doing okay. But if you don't stay calm, <laughs> don't stay safe, you need to let the quorum have the time to restore and support the load. So if you arrive to the symptom, you have a sudden death because here is already black and you have no symptoms here. This can be prevented but not treated. So after six weeks, if everything is doing okay with cryotherapy and so on, you can go back to a complete normal corium. I have observed this only after 2007 when I saw, uh, when I met Chris Pollitt in Geneva. I didn't see it the back to complete normal before. Only with cryotherapy you can achieve this. Prolonged continuous cryotherapy. I, um, at least I have observed that only after this. Or whatever, if you stay here, not here, you can have a chronic conumatis or li lifelong that can be asymptomatic, compensated, and the horse will die when the bone remodeling will reach the vascular frame with a sudden death. Or you can go to the symptomatic fall lifelong and uh, the horse will get old and older and older and uh, or he dies for the vascular frame and or dies for whatever. A, a, hearth, or a hearth quake or whatever. Anyway, on the chronic, you can develop the choreumosis that will compress with the rotation the coronary band uh, venous plexus. I use this and the euphoracing to soften the wall. What happens in a positive palmar angle that you will load the apex of the corium. So you will have bone remodeling here. Not everybody knows that. Anyway, this is why. Because you compress here, you have hematomas and bone remodeling here. In humans, we call this the horse foot. <laughs> and that's what happened. If you do the venogram, that's what you see. This is the red classification of club fit. 
in normal life, you don't always have one pathology. Maybe you, they are associated. Normally, the club foot is the first to show symptoms of uh, uh, lamellar caromitis. Or a traumatic solar choreomitis can lead you to contract the muscle and increase the gravity of the clap foot. Or whatever, but anyway, not only for lateral medial imbalance, but even for positive and uh, negative palmar angle, what you need to do? You need, uh, the key point is uh, the trimming and the positioning of the shoe. Not only to avoid the red nail, but also because if you put even a three-dimensional auto messaging shoe like this, <laughs> you will not slow down the process. You can slow down better than this, but anyway, you will have osteolysis and when it will arrive to the vascular foramen, end of the game. So your, the life, you are shortening the li potential life of your horse. If you put, look for the corium, and you put your shoe like this, you will have the horse that will die for whatever else, not laminitis, or so-called laminitis. Anyway, if we go to the hind feet, what happens? As for the front feet, they will be painful here, depending on the soft ground or hard ground or whatever, whatever hurts the corium here. They call this a reverse uh, rotation, but anyway, I use all, all these products, but what happens here? It happens that you can have the bone remodeling of the plantar processes. And uh, this is an example of a really negative palmar, plantar angle. You can, you can slow down the vicious circle, but you cannot stop. If you want to get into a virtual circle, you need to go to three dimensions. Otherwise, there is no way to do it in two dimensions. And what is the goal? Not only the vascular, because they, it's difficult that they have uh, fractures of the plantar processes, but it's very frequent that they develop an inflammation of the sciatic, as for humans. And with this, it can take even six, nine, some horses, 12 months just to reverse the inflammation of the sciatic. Many of my colleagues use cortisone to uh, uh, treat the inflammation, but this is still a vicious circle. The primary biomechanical co vascular cause and biomechanical of the bony column is the negative plantar angle, so you need to fix it. That's an example. Look at this line. This is a negative five. Just the trimming, corium guided, of course, with a, a, a diplomated on the corium. Uh, you can check on my website uh, how to get a di diploma on the corium after at least a 10, 15 years of uh, ferry experience. Otherwise, you cannot achieve this kind of uh, high le level knowledge and education, only with the trimming you can correct slightly the palmar angle, but with the sh three-dimensional shoeing you are much more successful. So just to resume, home ta uh, take home messages. Remember, we are dealing with primary needs, not secondary. We are dealing with secondary needs, not primary needs. So. Look for the corium, not for bones or tendons, because you can anticipate problems much more, much better. How to see the corium on any live horse? Only with venogram. So, if you want to avoid a red nail, you need uh, a corium guided trimming and showing to have a, visual, a virtuous circle on the corm. So these are the kind of uh, services I give. I improve the performance in order to achieve a red, a rose, a pink, <laughs> a pink corium. You can prevent lameness, preventing 
the uh, hematomas of the soul. I don't do orthopedic claimness because um, my colleagues, veterinar, veterinarians, furriers, osteopath owners, they call me for reference cases. So they just do the first visit and uh, in, in case you, they want to improve the performance for champions, they call me and we work in a team. Or for the pathologies when uh, the um, lameness uh, scale is more than uh, four or five or four months, you can prevent pathologies or you can do, or, or if it's getting late and late, I do the emergency service that that's the service I've worked for uh, 20 years and that's how I've built my reputation. So the goal is uh, to get to arrive when it's already gray, but to prevent that it, it becomes black. So how do I do? I use uh, just uh, x-rays for the performances surface, but it's not a orthopedic x-ray. That's not what we are taught at school. Uh, these uh, x-rays are podiatry and uh, I have developed a technique to measure exactly on the sagittal and horizontal plane how to measure for the quorum. But you need this because if you put your X-ray beams in the articulation, that's good for locomotion, but it doesn't. Uh, there is an optic distortion, so you don't have good measurement to achieve a good corium trimming or showing. So, of course, for the pathologies, you need a venogram. You don't need a venogram for performances uh, because I can. I have learned how to anticipate. Uh, uh, on an X-ray, how to draw what happens with the venogram yeah, after thousands of venogram. So, if you look for bones or tendon, be careful because it can be you could be scared, feel the scare you have even with the little waves. It's crowded there, even with little waves. Feel it, the fear, but. If you don't want so much fear, look for the core. You can deal with a high, bigger wave, with bigger problems, but feel how you are calm and you are handling a big problem calmly with a skilled quorum point of view. So. Follow us on uh, Equideo. Uh, we are um, doing some episodes on uh, horses I follow all uh, around Europe so far because the lockdown stopped me to go in uh, North Africa or Canada or Russia or whatever. Even England uh, is out of my range uh, at present, but uh, maybe the vaccine will let us open uh, that perspective uh, in, a, in a few weeks or months. Anyway, visit uh, my website, visit the uh, ACR website, Kevin Bacon, uh, try the products. I use them a lot. They are really high pro quality. But I want to put you in a, a question. Where do you want to set yourself? Put yourself the right question, because if you deal with uh, bo looking at bone and tendons, you are back of the wave. So you are not you are looking at, at the hoof capsule or at the bone on what is already happened four months ago. <laughs> if you want to anticipate whatever problem, you need to look for the core and maybe avoid the big problem, the big wave. So, what is the right question? Is your horse lame? Hey, <laughs> sorry, 100% of lame horses were re completely sound before being lame. So, this is the right question. Call now, do something for the welfare of your horse, and don't use any, uh, uh, never again, the 
no foot, no horse. That's a double negative affirmation. A better quorum gives you a better horse. Now, after the uh, foot poor performance uh, uh, causes, uh, as uh, I have shown you, uh, Dr. Lecoq will talk to you about uh, poor performance uh, for gastric problems and how to solve them. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Lorline Lecoq. I'm a specialist in equine internal medicine. And today we're going to discuss about gastric ulcers in the horses. So gastric ulcers is a vast debate. Uh, there are uh, a lot of horses with gastric ulcers. And clinical signs can vary from severe colic signs after feeding to a mild in performance intolerance. We already discussed a little bit earlier about into, uh, exercise intolerance in horses, but exercise intolerance can be caused by gastric ulcers in the horse. So uh, in between those two symptoms, we can have a very wide array of symptoms, like for example, a horse that is uh, 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 yawning and uh, chewing all, all day long, a horse that has a poor coat or uh, uh, that doesn't gain into muscle mass even with uh, heavy training. So these, uh, these clinical signs are also absolutely non-specific to gastric ulcers. So that's the major problem. First, we need to diagnose gastric ulcers. Diagnosing gastric ulcers is um, is very important because I told you already uh, the clinical signs can be caused by different problems, and it's uh, it's it's mandatory to go see inside the stomach. We don't have access to the stomach from the outside. So for that, we need to go uh, with a gastroscope, with uh, with an endoscope, do a gastroscopy. First, to do a gastroscopy, we need to prepare the horse. The stomach is filled with about 15 liters of food and uh, secretions. So if we go to this in, inside the stomach like that without uh, emptying it, we won't see anything. So to empty a stomach, we need to have the horse fasten for at least 12 hours. So that means no straw, no hay, of course no grass, and no grain. So they're usually very nasty when I'm coming around for a gastroscopy because they're really, uh, they're really hungry, but it's really important. What we ask to do also is maybe to retrieve water a couple of a couple of hours before the gastroscopy, so we ensure that the stomach is completely empty. It's really, really important to have an empty stomach because we have several areas of the stomach that we need to look at. And if the stomach is not completely empty, we might not be able to get to the bottom point of uh, the bottom part of the stomach, the pylorus, which is the exit towards the small intestine. And if we don't get there, we might lose some information and lose some uh, portion of the stomach and won't have the correct diagnosis. So, to do the gastroscopy, once the stomach is empty, we need to sedate the horse a little bit and we ran through the nose down the esophagus about two meters down, directly to the stomach. When we get to the stomach, we see that we have two different portions. One, the upper portion of the stomach, which is uh, uh, light pink and the lower portion which is very dark and almost red. As you can see on the pictures here, so this is the upper portion here, pretty light. It's called the non-glandular portion and here you can see examples of the glandular portion. So don't be afraid, it's not a major ulcer in the stomach, it's completely normal to have 
those two colors. A question that, uh, that I'm always asked is what does gastric ulcers look like? So uh, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, pictures and videos to explain you a little bit uh, what it looks like and what we're looking for. So let's first take a small video to show you uh, what we do when we enter the stomach. So here we, we're entering the stomach. As you can see on the left, we have a little bit of uh, food left. This is the glandular portion and we're going to go around and uh, 180 degrees and you see on the, up the upper part of the video that we can see the scope coming through the esophagus. And then if we go down, we're going to go through that little pool of liquid to exit the stomach. Uh, and uh, right in front of us, there is the pylorus. So we, we usually grade gastric ulcers. And now after this short video, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the different grades of gastric ulcers. So we have the grade one out of four. This is that yellow color that you see here on the right side of the screen. That is only on the non-glandular portion, the light pink portion. And this is called hyperkeratosis. This is the first stage of gastric ulcers. Then we have the stage two. As you can see here, you have a more prominent lesion but it's isolated. So this is called a grade two gastric ulcers. We can also have grade two lesions that are looking more uh, diffuse, like here, but, are, but that are really localized. So as you can see here, all, tho all those little dots here are uh, small gastric ulcers. So this is called a grade two. This is another portion, another example of the grade two. So you see those uh, strikes, uh, light, light, slightly uh, darker than the light, uh, the 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 light pink. Uh, this is this is also more superficial lesion, but very localized. So this is called a grade two. So different examples of grade two. Then we have the grade three. So as we increase the grades, we increase the severity of the lesions. So here, grade three are lesions more diffused, either 180, uh, 360 degrees around the uh, pink, light pink portion, or we can have another example of grade two, one big lesion like this one that you can see over here, but that looks pretty deep and pretty severe. So this is another example of the grade three. Grade four is either ulcers all over wherever you can see there are ulcers or really um, bleeding ulcers that, uh, that, that tells us that the severity of the lesion is, is very deep. We can also have ulcers on the glandular portion, so the dark pink portion. And it goes from light um, um, hyperemia. So hyperemia is uh, just a redness of the mucosa, as you can see on this example, up to really uh, excavation of the mucosa. And here you see that the lesions have a concave aspect. So there are pieces of mucosa missing, literally, with a crust inside. So this is the, uh, s the, the most severe kind of lesion that we can have in the pylorus. In between, you can have uh, isolated ulcers, bumpy ulcers, ulcers with a little crust, but you have all kinds of uh, different lesions in between. So because a movie is always better than pictures, let's show a grade three with on this video. So as you can see, you have at the bottom part the, non the glandular uh, portion of the stomach, very dark, and then the non-glandular all around. And you can see that you have uh, strikes of, uh, of, of ulcers all, um, 
all over 360 degrees around uh, the um, non-glandular portion. Uh, this, those, um, those stripes are uh, red and yellow because of uh, all the inflammation uh, associated to it. So this is a pretty severe grade of gastric ulcers. So now that we diagnosed gastric ulcers, what do we do? So there are two main components to the treatment of gastric ulcers. Treating the cause and treating really the lesions. So for, for treating the cause, usually in horses, gastric ulcers are caused by a, a, a disbalance between acidity production in the stomach and the buffering action of uh, food and saliva. So we need to uh, Basically, we need to go back to basics. A horse is a herbivore. Herbivore eats grass all day long, probably 22 hours out of 24. So we need to feed them with uh, forages of good quality, like uh, good quality hay, but as much as possible throughout the day. So a 500 kilo horse should receive about 10 kilo of hay, minimum I would say 10 kilo of hay per day. Uh, that means 2% of his body weight with uh, good uh, forages. Another portion in the management is decreasing the amount of, sh of starch and sugar in the in the in the diet, uh, so uh, usually we we give some grains with a high content of uh, cereals, and in cereals we have a lot of uh, starch, and uh, sometimes even to uh, increase the taste of the food we put some uh, molasses or things like that. Uh, horses with gastric ulcers really uh, need to have uh, as uh, as few starch and sugar in the diet as possible. Uh, let's say less than 20% is ideal. Uh, and so now we have a lot of uh, commercial feed that trade sugar and starch from the cereals to uh, soy or um, uh, rice bran or things like that to uh, bring some caloric intake and so we continue to have a horse that is uh, able to work but with um, with less impact on the acidity of the stomach so this is for the management now let's talk about treating those lesions that we saw so to treat lesions of the stomach uh, we have uh, first of all we need to um, to, 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 to know which kind of lesions we have. If we have only lesions in the non-glandular portion, then decreasing the acidity of the stomach is probably enough. But if we have lesions in the glandular portion or in both portion at the same time, then we need to have uh, the, the, that buffer activity plus uh, a coverage activity. So we're gonna we're gonna make like a crust around the lesion to cover it and to help it heal. So uh, treatments is, is based on 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 several uh, medication. We all know the omeprazole. For the, the crust, uh, we can use uh, uh, sucralfate, which will cover the lesion. But there's also um, uh, food supplements that surely play, plays a role in the treatment of, uh, of gastric ulcers too. So I hear a lot of fun facts about gastric ulcers in horses. So a lot of owners tell me that their horse is really stressed out, so he should have gastric ulcers. First of all, I see a lot of horses really stressed that don't show any signs of gastric ulcers and several really laid back horses that do have very severe gastric ulcers. So the stress, uh, the way we see it as a human being is not really a major uh, factor for uh, gastric ulcers. 
I hear also uh, that uh, some horses should work with uh, with a full stomach because an empty stomach uh, uh, might uh, aggravate uh, gastric ulcers lesions. Uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing that proves that it's efficient or not. Uh, so I would say that this is really part of the myth and legends about uh, gastric ulcers. Also, uh, I hear that a lot of people give some uh, medications before work or all, 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 all day long to uh, cover to uh, like uh, Gaviscon or uh, Sucralfate before work. Sucralfate can have a role and certainly has a role on uh, uh, gastric healing, but it needs to be done in a certain way and in combination with other medications. Uh, to give it all alone and some horses receive just hundreds of liters per year and there's probably no need uh, for that in the vast majority of the cases. So we're already at the end of this webinar. I hope you enjoyed and that you learned things about gastric ulcers in horses. Don't hesitate to ask questions uh, and we'll try to answer it in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for uh, listening us and so on. It's now questions time. We start with uh, my question, so we have the time uh, for the listener to, 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 to do some question to Laurelin as well. Okay, so my, I, I have a question from uh, Anthony Roda. The question is, is now time. Uh, the question is, uh, blood flow is really important for the hoof capsule, but what can be done to maintain blood flow and avoid the mineralization of P3 when you have on chronic laminitis a very bad and painful arthritis on coffin joint due to old sequesters? So this is a really big question because uh, we don't know exactly where is the chicken and the egg because many times uh, for a little arthrosis that in the acute phase of arthritis is painful uh, cortisone is injected inside the hoof uh, in, inside the articulation and this can lead to very bad laminitis so we don't know exactly where is the chicken and the egg Anyway, you are completely right. When uh, you want a three-dimensional shoeing uh, or auto-messaging effect with a boot or whatever, uh, the problem is uh, the, that uh, you, you give an instability to the articulation that can be painful. So what is more painful? Is the corium or is the articulation? It's very difficult to differentiate uh, which one is more painful. Sometimes one, sometimes the other. So if, uh, if you are sure that is not the corium, that uh, your shoeing is well positioned and not giving a pressure on the corium at the toe, um, one solution can be bisphosphonates, in local perfusion or in a, a general, um, or injected in directly in the articulation or whatever. Um, on the other side, uh, if it's really important that the horse keep moving because he has a competition and the chronic laminitis is compensated, so he's still in competition, and you have no time for that, <laughs> Of course, in the last chance, I would use uh, cortisone just to go for the competition, but uh, I would uh, avoid that as much as possible. I would uh, keep that as a last solution to advise to the referring vet of the team, uh, because I, I would not do that. <laughs> I, I would just suggest, but anyway, 
in my experience uh, as being conservative and uh, as being an expert in uh, uh, physical uh, therapies, I, w I have a very nice result when it's close to be really uh, not moving, so with a big uh, proliferating arthrosis, I would suggest to use shockwave. Of course, not in the acute phase, but in the uh, degenerative chronic phase of the arthrosis. I would use a shockwave that's so successful. I hope I have answered your question, Anthony. And uh, let's see if, the, if we have other questions even for Laurelin. Not so far. Maybe we have a jet lag. <laughs> this, uh, this streaming is going all over, all over uh, the world, from uh, Australia to Arabia to New Zealand to Canada to US, Brazil, wherever. Oh, of course, Europe. <laughs> anyway, if everything is OK, I would give the microphone to Laurelin, and uh, she can uh, say hello to everybody. And maybe we will see again. Uh, this is the first time we do this uh, streaming on live. Uh, but I think this is the future for us for as being uh, all the speakers in uh, all congresses and symposiums around the world. This, the world is changed, so I think this is a nice solution for the future and uh, we will do a lot of these uh, things uh, of this streaming and uh, and uh, this on live events so thank you oh of course we are both negative of course we are both negative and we keep the distance <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your attention and thanks for your questions thank you also to our sponsors uh, acr and Kevin Bacon. Um, we wish you a very pleasant evening now and uh, don't forget that the videos are still available on Facebook and YouTube. Bye-bye. <laughs>